<laughs> All right. Well, I, I'm excited tonight. This is one of my favorite uh, things to talk about, actually, is mind. Uh, because everything, uh, Ramakrishna says, everything is mind. And Holy Mother actually says that at some point as well. And when they say everything is mind, they mean everything is mind. And it's a wonderful thing to decode. It's a wonderful uh, piece to meditate on and to kind of check the reality of. And also, as you begin to accept it as a truth, the number of changes that take place in your thinking about things is quite or has been for me anyway, quite extraordinary. And so these are some of the scriptures uh, that uh, have kind of given me little wow moments like, oh my gosh, really? <laughs> and so I'm hoping that you feel that way also. Uh, but I want to encourage you to jump in with, with questions or challenges or uh, ideas that come to mind because this stuff is uh, almost infinite in its nature. And uh, the things that it inspires is, are quite wonderful to talk about. So please feel free to, to jump in. So this moment, I'll just kind of say some of the things that, that sort of summarize uh, this idea of the moment this the, and the mind. I guess it's a moment that we're talking about tonight, but a lot of these scriptures have to do with mind as well. That this moment is God. Uh, you know, it, it is the I am. It is, uh, it in and of itself is eternity. Uh, it's where we exist and the only place that we exist. Uh, everything else uh, falls into the category of mind alone. And uh, the mind, the moment is unchanging. The moment is the absolute. And the only thing that makes it appear to change is the mind and its recording of it. Recording and comparison, you know. And uh, so it's quite a fascinating and beautiful ideal because if you're wondering what is God or if God has always been elsewhere for you or God has always been other and seems distant and non-intimate, this meditating on the moment as divine, the moment as God herself, himself, is a wonderful antidote to that feeling of separation, to that feeling of, of distance between you and the divine. And that intimacy, that closeness is real and palpable when the attention is brought to it and when the mind is quieted. So this first part here uh, is, is from Sri Ramakrishna from in the gospel. And it says, all that you need is available to you in this moment. Uh, you know that I had a wonderful meditation one time in a very sunny shrine room in San Francisco, where I was sitting there kind of frustrated with my practice and frustrated with the fact that here I had been a monk for six whole years and why hadn't I realized anything yet? And uh, <laughs> so I was, feeling that way. And I don't know, you know, as things happen in meditation in, in the shrine, I just got this notion where it just seemed like it was being whispered in my ear. Everything you need is here. There's nothing missing. When you realize God, it's not going to be, be because you acquired something. It's not be going to be because you, you, you learned something. So he says, if you dare declare that you are free, this is Vivekananda, this paragraph, if you dare declare that you are free, free you are this moment, right? There it is. You have to declare your freedom. Of course, you have to understand freedom. <laughs> what does it mean to be free? And uh, it seems like an easy question, but it's not. Uh, like what what actually what does it mean to you to be free i'm going to throw it out there and then sit here and be quiet what does it mean to be free if you declared your freedom this moment what would you be declaring not to be a slave to anything yes not to be a slave to anything except god except what God. 
Uh, well. Not a slave, a servant. <clears throat> well. Then you're still not free. But we live in the world. Do we? <clears throat> I, 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 most of the times I think about freedom as being free of the mind. Uh, because it's the only thing that keeps coming back without me requesting it. Mm -hmm. uh, Wonderful. <laughs> I, I never request to be thinking. So absolute freedom has to, for me at least, has to be with that, without mind. Uh, even if it's for a moment and you were referring to to the moment so uh if if you go back to the minimal space of time that exact moment you can think of it as being free in every particular moment you have no no thought you have but you're not free because you start thinking again and I, it seems that I can never get rid of mine whenever, or it's not me choosing to be free. Mm. That yeah, you're 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 very close. You're actually right. I mean that that is that is a form of freedom. Uh, you know, I had this this time. I always hesitate to tell the story, but I'm going to jump in. I already have, and it's recorded, so I might as well share it again. I was taking a shower and I was trying to do the neti neti while I was showering. You know, I'm not this, I'm not this. And so as I was washing, you know, with the soap and I'd wash my, I'm not this and I'm not this and I'm not this, you know, and I just kind of tried to take a moment to remove my attention from everything that I'm not. And I was going along and I, I found it quite a blissful experience, you know, not that I was successful at, at any large degree. But I remember just feeling this wonderful bliss and I got out of the shower, I was drying off and I declared my freedom. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm, I'm absolutely free. And I told myself that mostly because Vivekananda tells us to, to, to declare our freedom quite regularly. So I did that. I said, okay, I'm absolutely free. And the first thought that occurred to me was like, oh, what shall I do with my freedom? <laughs> I'm free. What do I want to do? And it, it, I mean, I realized exactly what you're talking about there, Jose, is that freedom does not mean the freedom to do what we want to do. It doesn't mean that our desire is limited. It means that we're without desire. It means that you have to do nothing to be content. That's freedom. To be content with the perfection of the moment is to be free. And that can be described in many, many, many ways. It can be described shutting down the, the mind or purifying the mind. You know, the reason that the mind is active is because we are interested in it. You know, we do like change. We do like to watch the changes of the universe and we're identified with it. And so the mind is in the habit of feeding us our reflection and pulling our opinions about that reflection out of us. And so, you know, like you say, it's a matter of discipline in the beginning to discipline the mind, to come to a point where you only use the mind when you need the mind. And when the mind is not necessary, it's quiet. It rests in Om, as it were. It rests in silence or peace. So Vivekananda is saying here, if you dare say that you are free, free you are this moment. Right now, how do, how 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 come that doesn't happen? <laughs> you know, I many times in my life I've said I'm free, and nothing changed. You see, this is the importance of that truth, of that integrity in our life, and the depth of our meditations. You know that that we have to do the work to become aware of what our prayers are, what our thoughts are, what our actions are. Uh, you know, in a day. And what our words are, those three have to be in alignment for that to work. What you say, what you think, and what you do have to be in alignment. 
And you have to have the discipline within yourself so that when you say yes to something, you mean yes, and it happens, or you say no, and it doesn't happen. That there's no wishy-washy, there's no flip-flop going on, that we're in charge and we take our voice seriously. We take it as law. You know, and the way Brother Lawrence talks about that is to do absolutely nothing that is not the divine will. Right. The reason I I I I kind of pull back from the idea of you know God's will, uh, you know, being an impingement on freedom, is because in that freedom is the knowledge uh, that 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 there that you are that you know that that you don't there is no power greater there there is no uh there are no other uh competing ideas <laughs> or or wills out there you've unified you know that peace comes when you've become one person inside we're going to talk about that some more i i, I think I, i've got two lessons in my head right now but uh that this notion that that we we become one person you know uh right now all of us are at least two people inside we're a thinker and we're a listener you know the thoughts are playing and somebody's watching them we're two people somebody tells us that we're not going to have that piece of cake and then that other person in there says oh come on <laughs> You know, and we're in argument. We argue with ourselves. We try and discipline ourselves, and then there's argument. And we sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. Who wins and who loses? Who knows? <laughs> That's part of your meditation to figure out what's going on there. You know, so this this freedom is having that unification within. There is no, there is not two within us. There's one, and life comes spontaneously not from a consideration of something to be attained or gotten which means desire but spontaneously in the moment in our contentment with what is our satisfaction with what is and so our response to life is natural and free so he's the important thing is though to remember that your freedom is yours when you want it your enlightenment is yours when you want it it's not something that's given to you. <laughs> you know, the Divine Mother, of course, is painted as being the gatekeeper to enlightenment. But when, when uh, you know, when if you ask Ramakrishna, well, well, who is she and why is she controlling that? He would look at you in that very knowing way and say, she's the one that just asked that question. She's in there. She is of you. So if you dare declare that you are free, free you are this moment. If you say you are bound, well, bound you will remain. That's why I'm very, very serious about reminding people when we describe our spiritual lives and we say, oh, it's so difficult. Oh, I just can't sit that long. Oh, you know, my mind is so noisy. Oh, I'm, it's going to take me lifetimes to do this. If you say those things, you are setting up your reality. If you say it's going, this is hard, it will be hard. If you say that my mind is noisy, it will remain noisy. You know, you are the one who is putting together your game. This is all you. Otherwise, Vivekananda could not have said that first part, that if you say you're free, if you dare to say it with meaning, with conviction, you will be free. So he says, if you are bound, you will, if you say you are bound, you will remain bound. This is what Advaita boldly declares. I have told you the ideas of the dualists. You can take whichever you like. They're both true. They both are framed differently, but they are the same. If this room is full of darkness for thousands of years and you come in, bring in the light and the evil goes in a moment. Build your character and manifest your real nature, the effulgent, the resplendent, the ever pure, and call it up in everyone that you see. All right, so this is what he's telling us. This is how we get to that ability of declaring our freedom. This first one, build your character. What does that mean to you? 
I say, I say, build your character. What's number one on your list? What are you going to do? Purify the mind. All right. What and what what would that involve? What is it that makes a mind impure? Desire. Okay. Uh, yes, that's true. It's more fundamental than that. Is Where does desire? Yamas and the niyamas. Yamas and niyamas. Yes, they help in the purification of the mind. They definitely are the way to purify it. Yes. The thing that the, the impure mind is a mind that has me and mine in it. Mm -hmm. that, that's what makes a mind impure. Uh, because of the me and mine, in order to have a me and mine, you have to have li a list of limitations and restrictions or attributes to give them an easy, more identifiable thing. You have to have a list of attributes that you identify with. This is me. That's not me. This is who I am. That's not who I am. So if you have this this restricted or attributed idea of who you are, you've got me and mine in your mind, and that's impure. So yes, purifying the mind is definitely one of the things. But character, Vivekananda says, is your habits. Habits are what creates character. Good habits create good character. Bad habits create bad character. And so to, to this first instruction here it to, to build your character means select your set of habits that are beneficial to you as a spirit, you as soul, and live accordingly. Develop good habits, disciplined habits, habits that aren't wishy-washy and don't change based on desire or feeling or mood or state, things that you're committed to that are help, helpful and advantageous to you. So build your character, manifest your real nature. And what is that? The effulgent, you're a light, you're a charm to be around, you're wonderful to be around, you're always seeing the divine, you know, you're always looking for opportunities to serve and to help and, and to show compassion and to encourage and to lift somebody up. You know, you're <laughs> so you're effulgent. Let your let your nature be what it is. By nature, you are effulgent. So undo the things that are covering that light. The resplendent, the ever pure, the ever pure. So the, the ever pure is is that which you you are ever you're never considering me and mine. <laughs> That's we'll go with that. We'll stick with that definition of pure. You're not concerned about number one, as it were. <laughs> you're focused on you're focused on others and just really always thinking for their best. Build your character, manifest your real nature, the effulgent, the resplendent, the ever pure, and call it up in everyone that you see. All right? Call it up. What does that mean? You go around and tell everybody, hey, be, be, be your resplendent, ever pure self. No. That means you see them, you look at them looking for the positive, right? The Holy Mother was like that. You know, she says that there was a time in her life where she saw fault in everyone, but that she came to a point after years of practice where she says, I tell you the truth, I cannot find fault with another. I cannot do it. What a marvelous person to be around somebody who never sees your faults, somebody who's always looking for your advantage, somebody who, somebody who just, just believes in you and just thinks you're the cat's meow. <laughs> you know, and they bring that out in you when they see you. You know, I talk about that in these holy folks. When you, when you meet a really holy person, one, you know that they're holy because they make you think about God. When you're around them, it's just somehow easier to think of the divine. And the second thing is they make they they show you yourself by the way they look at you. They don't stop at your eyes, they don't stop at your personality, they don't stop at your jokes. They look right past it all and you feel that awkward sort of nudity like what's what are they looking at? And you know, 
what they're looking at. They're looking at mother right through your very own eyes. They're looking right at her and they see her. And the fact that they see her through your own eyes brings you, brings you to that point. You, you sense it in yourself. You feel your own highest ideal. That's what it is to call this up in others around you. Now, we can't do that if we're constantly distracted, right? We can't do that if we don't believe that we are this. If we don't remind ourselves constantly of these things. You know, Vivekananda gives us permission. Say as often as you can say, I am ever free. I'm ever pure. I'm ever beloved. You know, always know I am the immortal. One without a second. I am that divinity. I am love. I am existence, you know, I am unchanging absolute. This is, these are beautiful ideals and you should do it. You know, I think we talked quite a few, I don't know, weeks or months now, where we went through 1 Corinthians 13 verses one through eight, right? And it gives a beautiful description of what love is there. You know, love is kind, love is pure, love is not self-seeking. Love does not find fault with others. Love, you know, delights in the truth. Love is, you know, uh, uh, not selfish. What, what else is he saying there? Some beautiful things. Love always hopes, always believes, always trusts. Love never fails. And I bring that up because as a practice, you know, along with your meditation in the morning, when you're sitting there brushing your teeth and you can't help but look in that mirror in the bathroom, Instead of mourning the new levels of melt that have happened to your face as the years have passed, instead of looking for another gray hair, <laughs> instead, of, instead of doing all these wonderful things that I catch myself doing as I brush my teeth in the morning, repeat to yourself that scripture and put your name in it. I am ever free. I am ever pure. I always hope. I always believe. I always trust. I never fail. No say those things and don't cognate about them don't analyze them say them and feel them know them feel you will feel some resonance in there because they are true and they are more true than anything else in the mind so feel them resonate when you say them know them to be true and it will manifest in you so call it up then in yourself when you see yourself and then for the rest of your day, make the commitment. And your practice is all about trying to remember this commitment so that if you don't get into the office or get onto the phone and suddenly just think that you're living in this world, you've never lived anywhere. You know, you've watched a world and you're watching the world now. You've never been in it. It is in you. Always remind yourself of these things so that you don't get caught or stay caught and stuck in this whirlwind of change, which is not actually happening. And you are not the doer. <laughs> so he's telling you here, be this, see this, and call it up in everyone around you. Be mindful always. This is the presence of God. This is being in the moment. It's seeing spontaneously this truth that has always been there, but has not been apparent to us because we're so distracted by our stories, so distracted by our to-dos, our wants and needs, our plans and planning. I wish that every one of us had come to such a state that even in the vilest of human beings, we could see the real self within in, and instead of condemning them, say, rise, you effulgent one, Rise, you who are always pure. Rise, you birthless, you deathless, you almighty, and manifest your true nature. These little manifestations do not befit you. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think I need Vivekananda as a roommate. <laughs> That's just what I need to hear when I come crashing out of my room in the morning, stumbling toward the shower, you know, trying to make sense of <laughs> things, to have him standing there saying, you, look who it is, it's the effulgent, ever pure, ever free. Of course, I'd probably hit him, but 
you know, this wonderful notion, live in this reality, fill yourself with this reality, put it all around you. You know, what you think you become. Do not give voice to the critic inside that's telling you otherwise, because that is the lie. That is the self that is not the self. <laughs> so do not let those things tear you down. Your voice inside should always be a voice of encouragement. You know, it should always believe in you. It should always hope in you. Every time you say, I'm not going to do it again, it always believes that. It will not become cynical toward you. <laughs> it will not. You know, this is something, this is what our practice is about in, practic in practical matters, in, in a practical way. This is what we are allowing to happen within. This rise of joy, this triumph of integrity, this wonder of bliss you know, and contentment. And he wishes that every one of us could see this in the most vile of human beings, that we would not hold anybody's faults, even the most vile person, even in the politicians. <laughs> that we would see this highest ideal. See the real self within instead of condemning and say, rise, you effulgent one. You know, it's always nice. Uh, and I used to do this every now and then when I was riding the subway to work in San Francisco. You just pick a random stranger and pray for them, you know, in this sort of way. Just pick a random stranger and just say, Ma, why don't you just do something super nice for that person today? Why don't you just give them some new idea that just changes their experience of living? What a beautiful thing. I hope they see love today in a wonderful way. And just go around praying little prayers in your idle time for the people around you. You know, when you're doing your meditation, <laughs> even though it's largely symbolic, you know, say, decide that the next five mantras, repetitions of God's name that you're saying, that they're not for you. You're doing this for that random lady sitting across the way on the bus who was knitting or that grouchy old man that, you know, pushed that woman when he got on board. Say five japam for them, you know, say five japam for your friends, say five japam for your family. Do your practice for others. <laughs> it's true that, you know, we need all the practice for ourselves that we can get. But you'll find there's a great deal of power that's very helpful to you when you do your practice for the benefit of others also. Mother used to do that, the Divine Mother. She would do her practice for others. This is the highest prayer. All right, now this is a beautiful statement. He says, this is the highest prayer. To see this and to think this about others, that's a prayer. And Vivekananda says, this is the highest of prayer that Advaita teaches. This is the top of the mountain. This is the one prayer to remember our true nature, the God who is always within us, thinking of it always as infinite, always as almighty, always as ever good, ever beneficent, ever selfless, ever bereft of all limitations. And because that nature is selfless, it is strong and fearless, for only to selfishness comes fear. He who has nothing to desire for himself, whom does he fear? And what can frighten her? What fear has death for him? What e fear has evil for her? So this constant knowing inside that this is our nature, to the point where it becomes our understanding of ourself. This is how we become free. You know, this is how we cease to experience this large world and, and its power over us and the fear that we live in, in its mercy. We do not. This is our dream. And in our realization, by learning this, knowing this, and coming to understand this absolutely, that's the faith that moves mountains. <laughs> That's the faith that throws them in the sea. All right. 
It's a faith in yourself that you are this blissful manifestation of divinity, ever free and ever pure. We shared this verse a week ago or two. It says, the master Ramakrishna said, if a pea falls into filth, it grows into a pea plant nonetheless. That's the biggest promise of the night right there for you. You, we can all come up with a list of filth that we think is our true self. I'm selfish, I'm mean, I'm inconsistent, I'm a hypocrite, you know, all these things. The, the accuser is in there, no doubt. You know, actually in, in Christianity, that's that's one of the other names of Satan is the accuser. And so if you've allowed yourself to become the accuser inside, you've become the equivalent of your own Satan, your own destroyer. So do not, do not be your own accuser. Accept your fault and transcend. That's not of my nature. That belongs to the mind. That belongs to the body. That belongs to story. I'm ever free, ever pure, ever blissful. So keep, keep saying that because what you think is what you become. If a pea falls into filth, it grows into a pea plant nonetheless. So you're destined. You can, <laughs> you're destined. You can't be the worst person you want to be. It's all temporary. <laughs> you, you're going to be that nice person no matter what. Mother will drag you screaming and kicking into sainthood, but you, <laughs> you will arrive. You will be there. And you should know that. And you should accept that. And it should bring you great joy. <laughs> M responds to him. Ah, but there's still the eight bonds. You know, there's always that person in the crowd. Yeah, but <laughs> that's nice. Uh, and Ta uh, Takor says, they're not the eight bonds. They're the eight fetters. But what if they are? These fetters fall off when? In a moment. By the grace of God. Do you know what it is like? Suppose a room has been kept dark a thousand years. The moment a man brings light into it, the darkness vanishes, not little by little. Can you take that hint? You're not going to get to your realization little by little. That's not how it is. You don't grow into it. <laughs> you accept it and accept it and accept it until one day that last little bit of veil, that last little smudge of me and mine falls off. And you see what you've always been. You know the truth of these things. In the very core of everything you've ever thought you were, you understand and know. So what about these bonds? So what about these excuses about what you are and how difficult it is and what your life has done and what your mother's done and what your father did and how hard it is and impossible? So what? Give yourself that permission to leave that story. Give yourself that permission to lay down those faults and not be identified by them anymore. And remind yourself, maybe from a very small voice at first, but remind yourself, I am free, ever free, ever blissful. I am that one divine love. They're not eight bonds, but they're eight fetters. But what if they are? These fetters fall off in a moment by the grace of God. Do you know what it's like? Suppose that room has been kept dark a thousand years. The moment you bring light into it, the darkness vanishes, not little by little. Haven't you seen the magician's feet? He takes a long string with many knots and ties one end to something, keeping the other in his hand. Then he shakes the string once or twice and immediately all the knots are undone. Have you seen that trick? I'll do it for you if you haven't. I did a, I did a lecture. I, that's, that's the one magic trick I learned as a kid. <laughs> Unfortunately, I stopped doing it after I'd cut the string into too many small pieces to use anymore. So, so anyway. Um, uh, is he saying when he says he shakes the string once or twice, is he talking about the guru or the or himself or like 
is is that the the influence or what does he mean oh that's a good question i like that one what does he mean by shaking the string once or twice you see what he's what he's saying there you consider the whole situation one ha has has the string really been tied into knots no was there any reality to it no and so the one or two shakes is an effort but is the is the magician actually untying the knots with those one or two shakes no it's just part of the fun it's just part of the thing it's like boom it's done instantly but nothing was done because it was a trick to begin with it was a sleight of hand to begin with and i think maybe one way of course we could open this up and talk about it but i think in one way he's talking about your practice your practice is the one or two little shakes you know you're not really doing anything <laughs> you're not doing anything not even a really in there you're not doing anything you know your practice is not what's going to bring you to your realization mm -hmm. it is always by grace and grace alone but your practice will give you the, the understanding that you need grace <laughs> that you need it bad and finally you'll be able to accept it until you know you need it you can't accept it you won't accept it right so the, the, it's our relationship with practice it's understanding that this comes through grace through the permission of the of our divine nature a realization it's not coming through effort and work and a process you're not climbing a mountain you know you <laughs> you're trying to see what is anybody have another idea on that or a it's like the illusion falling off in a way yes absolutely and an illusion falling off you know whatever occurs when that happens really doesn't occur you know when you see one of those visual illusions you know that somebody draws one of those things and you're looking at it trying to see you can't see it you can't see you can't see it. then you see it and you're like ah and then you can't unsee it ever again. So what did you do? Well, you didn't do anything. You just had to let go of seeing the other thing that you were always looking at and to, and to let the, your eyes see it again for the first time. So that's really what we're doing with this moment. We're trying to see this moment again for the first time instead of looking at it like we think it is, like we think it's going to be, you know? we let but it be unless you're enlightened um you don't really see it right i mean you you know, <coughs> this can be that um, it's a catch yeah yeah so you're right so um so i think so you so in the end you just end up uh end up with the with the surrender saying okay so it is well definitely you definitely end in surrender no doubt you know you lay down the veil which is really all you're doing you're laying down the veil ego is that veil any belief that you have about yourself that starts with an i that says i am if there's anything else after that that's what you're going to surrender you're going to surrender until there's only i am and uh, when you can know that to be the truth, that you can't you can't list attributes unless you're going to list all of them <laughs> or none of them. You get your choice, you know. Mm. Practice, 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 surrender. Practice, practice, practice. Yes, remember, remember, remember. That's all. Awareness, awareness, awareness. Use different words. You know, our practice may or not get there, depending on what we're how we're practicing. <laughs> Just think awareness, awareness, awareness. Repeat these things, you know, as often as you can. Do whatever you can during the day to, to keep returning. Just like Brother Lawrence gives these gives these same instructions. As many times as you can in a day, go inside and reset. Come back into yourself. Leave 
leave yourself as secretary, leave yourself as office manager, leave yourself as X, Y, or Z, and just be for a moment in the silence of your own self. Just be there. So in the book, I Am That, Maharaj is going to, this next, these next few quotes are from Sri Nishargadatta Maharaj. So he says, time is endless, though limited. Eternity is in the split moment of the now. We miss it because the mind is ever shuttling between the past and the future. It will not stop to focus on the now. It can be done with comparative ease if interest is aroused. So he just in a roundabout way said the same thing as earlier. Say that you're free, you'll be free. See the moment as eternity and you, can, you will see it. You know? So time is, lim is limited, but eternity is in the split moment of the now. It's, it's, this is a fascinating, fascinating thing to think about. It will open up a world, if it hasn't already for you, in just such a delightful way that this moment is all that has ever been. It's not a passing thing. It never moves. It's always here. We become aware of it because it is the one constant thing in our life that is not changing. It's the moment. And this past and this future, you guys know where I'm going with that. What is your past? How do you get a past? How do you get a past? You know how you From get a past? Story, but, you build your story, you're remembering, you create memories and hold on to them. What are, And what are they? What are those? What's the Vedantic word for that? <laughs> attachments. Hmm. Your past is composed entirely of your attachments. They are things that came and went and you wouldn't let go of them. You wanted to share your immortality with them. And so how did you do that? You saved them in yourself. You added those attachments to your mind, right? But they really aren't in the past because anytime you remember them, where do you remember them? In the present. <laughs> you can't go into the past and remember it. You can only bring the past into the present. The present is the only thing that makes anything real. It is the only reality. So your past is your attachments. And you walk around with them. And what do they do? They color your moment. They're a lens that, don't, that doesn't, no longer allows you to see the moment as it was the first time you saw it. You know, they, they color your moment they, as, as it is. Things in the moment may remind you of things and you bring up these attachments and suddenly they're missing in the moment. And if the attachments are missing in the moment, what happens then? Future. What is the future? The future is your desires. And why do I say that? Because you need the future in order to manifest the missing attachments in the moment. You need a plan to go get them. Right. Remember my pizza story, my the one story I probably tell too often, you know, that's the reality of it. The day is perfect. You smell pizza. Well, that would be fine. That would be a nice addition to a perfect day. But what does it do? It brings up your attachments. Oh, pizza. God, I love pizza. And then you look at the moment. You're like, oh, my God, look, this moment doesn't have any pizza in it. It's imperfect. It must be fixed immediately. Ah, oh, but I'm a monk. I have no money. How am I going to get a piece of pizza to manifest in the moment? Oh, Swami gave me $20 in that Christmas card. It's back in the monastery. Oh, thank God I've got a future because now I can walk to the monastery. I get that card and I come back here to escape to New York pizza on Polk Street. And I can make this moment perfect by having a piece of pepperoni pizza. And I will believe that story. And that is my delusion and why I will never find happiness, because having already been contented with the day, I smelled pizza. I could have stayed contented with the day and added the beautiful smell of pizza to it and kept going. But I brought up my attachments and I saw the moment lacking. It was no longer perfect for me. And so I had to engage myself in this effort of manifesting a desire into the present. 
And that is why we have imagined a future. So you create your past with your attachments. You create your future with the desires that, that come from that. And he's saying here, we spend all of our time bouncing in our mind back and forth between our desires and our attachments. Our desires, our attachments, our desires, our attachments. And we spend no time being present in a moment that is always perfect. It may not be perfect to a body. It may not be perfect to a mind. But to a divine soul, the moment is always perfect because it's in the presence of God. Because that moment is the presence of God. Wouldn't our entire perception dissolve if we were truly in the moment? Because the only yes. way there are constructs is from memory and training and filters. That so there true. would be no pizza, there would be no walking, there would ah, be this this needs to be tested. Hmm. This needs to be tested. I, I will I will say, granted, the world's going to go on because nobody's going to do this. <laughs> or not many people are going to do this. So there's going to be plenty of people making pizza for perfect moments. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but for those of us who know that pizza doesn't make a moment perfect, uh, we have to do something else. The reason that that's not necessarily true, though, the, the whole in that kind of thinking is that you forget your nature, right? You forget that, that if we were to completely remove our attachments and remove our desires, that we would not, which, which look at Ramakrishna, look at Jesus, look at Buddha. They completely removed their attachments. They were completely free from their desires. They didn't sit down and drool. You know, they didn't go to bed and never wake up again. They were very active. They talked to people. They carried on their ministries. They, they taught you know, they traveled, they went to the circus, they went to the park, but they didn't go there for a, a uh, to get. They weren't trying to get anything from it. They were just in the flow of life spontaneously as it was. And their, their, their nature manifested. So love is going to be what manifests in you. You know, love is going to manifest and it might manifest a pizza for someone else. It might manifest a new car. It might manifest a house, you know, but whatever it manifests, it manifests freely with no sense of me and mine, no sense of ownership, no sense of need, no sense of longing. You could, you could have that new car appear in the garage and you could walk away from it at the, in the same moment without any, any thought about it whatsoever. So you see, not everything would come to a halt, but everything would be immensely purified. We would probably, you know, probably begin seeing, you know, like, because uh, doership is what makes things disappear. You know, look, look at how the ultimate capitalist environment is a, 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 a suburb of Home Depot houses, <laughs> you know, where most of them are all the same, the materials are all prefabbed, and we just stamp them out, you know. You go back and you look at the way they, like the old days, the old houses, the old castles, you know, the old custom neighborhoods where they've got, you know, these funky windows and these little these little pretend castle turrets on the corner of their house and <laughs> you know that's a day that that was a day when when more i think more generously our nature was manifesting it wasn't being shut down by cost cost and effect <laughs> but, but i mean even ramakrishna would say that or he would freeze he would he would be unable to move when he was truly, completely immersed in, in the divine. And he yeah. said he had to retain a little ego to participate in the world that we perceive. Yes. Let that become your problem. <laughs> yes, you're right. Let that become your problem. 
But it know, is true, so, I mean, uh, you know, in terms of <clears throat> when you truly abide in yourself um, uh, fully, uh, 100%, then it's, it, it, you bypass the mind, right? There's almost like a no mind situation. Yes, um, the mind is the mind is calm. Yeah, yes. and and yet mm, when you try uh, to function, mm, uh, holding on to that stillness, um, uh, but uh, you're you're not holding on to anything, uh, right? Or abiding in the stillness, right? Mm. As you abide. Well, in... no, no, no. You are in stillness. You are stillness. Right. It's not. A, it's you are that. It's yes, not an experience want, of that. Mm. Right. But I was coming to the part after that that uh -huh. as, as one starts to uh, interact, like Sylvia was saying, in with the world, um, there is some there is some mind that that comes to play, or is it not a spontaneous action? where mind yes. is not, not playing at all. It's just action happening. Yes. That's yes. And that's the truth of the matter. Ramakrishna is very adamant. He says, he says numerous times uh, in the gospel, you are not the doer. That means you're not the doer, regardless that your mind has certainly convinced you of that and your ego insists on it. Your entire story depends on it. And that's why you can't see God. The fact is you are not the doer things happen and they will continue to happen even after you even when you realize that you're not the doer like that young boy remember the story of the young boy playing that car game in the in the in the phoenix airport that i that i told there was a little yeah. kid he must have been like six years old mm -hmm. reaching up and playing one of those car racing games at, at one of those video game things uh and he was working really hard at it, keeping that car on the racetrack on the screen as it went around and around trying to beat the other cars. And his father comes, taps him on the head, says, Joey, come on, we got to catch the plane. They just made the announcement. And Joey's like, Dad, I can't. The car's going to crash. Well, Dad pulls Joey away. I'm still watching. And I realized Joey never put a quarter in the machine. The machine was running on demo mode. Mm -hmm. But because the car was programmed to run, stay on the road, and Jimmy's mind or Joey's mind wanted the car to stay on the road and the steering wheel was only there to keep the car on the road. He assumed I'm making this car go on the road. And if you tell me that I have to let go of this steering wheel, it's just going to all go straight to hell and this car is going to crash all over the place. and The game's over. That's why I'm saying this needs to be experimented with because you just might find that you're not as necessary as an ego as you think you are. This world will carry on. Even your job, you can do your job with no mind. Mm. You can do your job in peace and silence. You know, when the body's hungry, the mind knows what it needs. The mind knows where to get the, get the butter and the eggs out of the fridge. It doesn't require your identity with it. That's, you know, they ta they're talking to each other all the time. <laughs> body and mind. It goes spontaneously like that. And if it doesn't, then the supernatural things start happening. You know, food starts showing up. <laughs> Clothes start showing up, you know. But we're, we're not, you know, we these things we have to take on faith. Why faith? This is why faith is so important, because these things are not obvious. And they're utterly contrary to our worldview, which is why we're, we're stuck, why we're in our delusion and why we have to be willing to let go. We have to give ourselves permission to try this. You know, I've probably, I've already said more times than is appropriate, you know, that I'm learning this firsthand these days mm -hmm. by living in the conditions that I'm living in right now. And really, <laughs> and really trying to hold on to it because I tell you my mind wants things that it's that it sees itself as being in charge of it it wants it wants to be the one making the plans it wants to be the one laying things out and uh you know that's the nature it's of arguing the that 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 is not i was just saying that there's maybe two things going on here 
Oh, yes. If there's the level of a Ramakrishna who can live in the, who can have those experiences and come back from them and live in the world. But for us, we're in, we can learn to be instruments. We're, we're not the doer, we're the car, (laughs) we're the, um, the tool through which things can, I mean, and we just go about doing whatever it is that is supposed to happen for our lives, as opposed to um, trying to invent our, our future and hold on to our past. I mean, I understand that. I'm not saying that you have to have this ego, the doer ego to live just that to experience the forms and the social structure and everything that we think we experience, there has to be some scrap of identity that's separate from the absolute truth, which is unfiltered, unlabeled, un, un has no attributes. It's it's just beyond anything we can even imagine. That's all I was talking about. It, it is true. You need an element of ego to suffer. It is true. You know, but at some point we're not going to want to suffer anymore. And uh, and it's available to us not to. So you're right. You know, this this is an ideal that we're talking about. And we have working ideals that we're trying to accomplish, you know, because we see it as linear and we see it as an accomplishment and as, a, as an acquisition. But we have to work against that to know that that's not true, that this is our nature and that it is normal to be enlightened, <laughs> you know, and that there's there there uh, the way that we practice this is to find contentment in our life as it is. And when when our mind starts telling us, you know, gosh, it'd be nice to have an extra office off the you know, top floor. Gee, it would be really nice to have a Tesla. <laughs> you know, it's like when the mind starts making suggestions out of discontent, it's our practice to return to the perfection of the moment. It's like, is that, you know, we discern, is that, where is that coming from? Sometimes you do need a new car. I'm not saying you can't get a new car, but I'm saying we're always very discerning about the condition of mind and what, what it's doing, what we believe it's doing you know and that we do our best to break the story because the truth of the matter is that we're not the doer and life will go on whether or not you believe it's your life or not it goes on it carries on and yes there will be a fraction of ego there that's not going to be a problem (laughs) you know uh, creating ego is not our weakness or well it is our weakness but we're really good at that weakness <laughs> we're really we're really good at creating ego of feeding ego the hard part for us <laughs> in this joke is uh is is knowing that we're bigger than ego <laughs> knowing that ego is just a small fraction of the whole and it's unnecessary as it were you know so yes, all the things that you're thinking are true. Just be careful. Don't don't accept as truth things that aren't true. Even if they're an ideal and even if they're way beyond us. You know, when Jesus says, I to tell you the truth, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, get up and throw yourself into the sea, and verily I tell you the truth, this mountain will throw itself in the sea. Okay, that's a problematic statement. We can immediately go to the fact that like, oh, my God, what a mess everything would be if everybody was running around throwing mountains into the ocean. You know, it's like, how could that be true? And, and you know, it's so far beyond our experience. And yet he emphatically says it. Verily, I tell you the truth. He doesn't just repeat it. <laughs> he gets emphatic. He's like, look here, sit down for a minute and shut up about everything you think you know about the nature of this world and listen to this. You have the ability to say to that mountain, get up and throw yourself into the sea, and it will obey you. No, no ands or or buts. I'm done. I've told you the truth. Now we can go get lunch. You know, this is the thing. 
we need to make sure that we hear these statements of faith louder than we hear all of the reasons that they just can't be. That it just does how, 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 what, why, how, can. And I and uh, I, I wanted to apologize, Shavia, because I wasn't picking on you. I, I always, in my mind, those are the voice of the general. We all, we all feel those things. We all, we're all saying those things. We're all sitting in houses. <laughs> we're all, you know, we're all, we're all holding up our own world in our mind. And uh, and so, but this is our opportunity to push against that, to insist on the beautiful, to insist on the true, even though it seems like all kinds of things would happen if if we practice this. But it's because we're practicing it still from an ego perspective, right? And that ego, because we're because we're still in that particular perspective. When we're told we're not the doer, there's no way to understand that. There's no way that we can normalize that as long as we have that sense of doership, as long as we have that ego inside, as long as we have that sense of, of I am X, Y, and Z going on in the impure mind. And so that's why we have to accept it on faith, because it's something that simply can't be seen from our current perspective. It can't be seen from any perspective. <laughs> and we don't know what that means yet. And so that's, but we don't let go of the whole truth. We just sit there and think, okay, this is the truth. And somehow it's true. I'm just going to sit with that, <laughs> you know? And that's, that's, that's the magic part. We just sit with that. Nothing's going to happen, but at some point it's going to be like, Ah, uh, aha. <laughs> and it's going to be you that's going to be sitting there unmoving. You know, that your husband comes in the room to find you in ecstasy and be like, what? What? Sevilla, come out of it. <laughs> You're destined. You can't escape it. Very important to know. Oh my gosh, where did it's 807. Do you guys have anything planned before tomorrow morning? We can just keep going, right? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, we barely got started here. See, that's my mouth just wanders. Anyway, we'll stop here for the evening. We'll pick this up again. This one we will pick up. I've, I've, I've said that every week, but when I've gone back and looked at what we missed, I decide to go on anyway. Uh, we'll, we'll pick up this next week here because this is, this is amazing stuff that will feed you in such a beautiful way. The more you think about it, the more you, the more you ponder these truths. And the more we give ourselves permission inside to let them be true, which is hard to do, very hard to do. And, uh, oh, I shouldn't say that. See, there I am writing my own story. But <laughs> 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 they are our nature. So they really should not be hard to do. It's what we are. It's the truth of the matter. So it, it, it is more difficult for us to maintain an ego than it would be for us to maintain enlightenment. Know that that's true. We're working much harder now at maintaining our delusion than we'll ever have to work at maintaining the truth once we see it, once we know it. So, all right, any, any, any closing thoughts? <laughs> any at this arbitrary closing of the evening? Any last ideas? Yeah, I had a last idea. Good. And I, I don't know, maybe yeah, I'm, I'm barking up the wrong tree. But then I, sometimes a, a devotee's uh, idea saying everything is done by God. God is everything. Maybe that's what Sevilla was trying to say. That yeah. he's the doer. You know, I have no will here. It's God does everything. Yes. That, that becomes like a little bit easier for some people. Well, no, that's the, yeah, that's the path of bhakti and that's true. And that yeah. is the way to go about it. But it's saying the same thing. Yeah. But yeah, in this instance, like because I, I straddle both sides and like this becomes much easier. It's like, okay, you know. Yes, this yes. Is God's, will. It's God's doing it, let it be done. Absolutely, absolutely. And the practice for, for that is the same practice as for the other. It's just constantly knowing and remembering mm -hmm. and letting it get down really deep so that you stop doing things and blaming yourself for it. Right. You know, you know. Stop, stop taking ownership. 
here I'm going to get myself in big trouble. Stop owning your own karma. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stop owning your own karma. Mm -hmm. Because yes, there's karma, but it belongs to a mind and it belongs to a body, and neither of those are you. Mm -hmm. yep. So that's 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 the thing. So yes, God is the doer. And uh, you know, ultimately we know that thou art that, but not in a particular, because God is not a particular. God is all uh, and a particular. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to have to close up and giggle for a while if we, if we keep going. All right. Thank you, Thank you Swami. Yes. I'm glad everyone is Excellent. here. Excellent. Good night. Lots to think no. about, not even Indeed. to think about, to ponder. Indeed. We'll yeah. enjoy it. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Good night. Jai Ma.